Hello there, I'm Chuck Todd and welcome to Meet the Press Report Season 3. We're very excited about this and we're happy you're here. As you might know by now, every week now we take a deep dive into a single topic. And this week it's climate change, but it's not like the other climate change specials you watch. We're not going to focus on academic studies or the 100-year projections because the bottom line is climate change isn't coming, it's here. It's already here. In fact, in just two months, there have been what NOAA classifies as major climate events in 27 states. And in case you're wondering what the definition of major climate event is, it's anything from extreme heat, drought, rainfall, flash floods, hurricanes, tropical storms, and wildfires. Just put all that in perspective. Just the last two months. And it brings us to the western part of the country because the southwest, in a word, is parched. A mega drought lasting more than two decades is drying up the Colorado River. In fact, the federal government had to declare a water shortage for the first time ever because of this problem. And what does this mean? It means water and hydropower supplies have had to be reduced in some of these western states. And now there's growing concern that this area of the country in particular, where Phoenix was the fastest growing city in America in the last decade, is growing faster than the natural resources can support. Our own Cal Perry takes us on a tour down the Colorado River. The Colorado River is what gives life to our American West. A seasonal snowpack in the Rockies gives way to streams which feed the river, each spring replenishing the water supply that 40 million people rely on. From the upper basin in Colorado through Utah and south to the lower basin, our first stop is Lake Powell, the second largest reservoir in America hitting its lowest level this year. And the Glen Canyon Dam, a critical hydropower source for seven states where power generation is plummeting. It's vital to communities throughout the southwest. The government says this dam has a one in three chance of stopping power production altogether by 2023. Southwest through the Grand Canyon and 360 miles downriver, we find the crucial piece of infrastructure to America's continued western expansion. The greatest dam in the world. Except now it bears the scars of a new climate. This is a visual representation of climate change. We're here at Lake Mead, and just like Lake Powell, it's at its lowest level ever. As you can see, it's lost 140 feet of water in just 20 years, and the effect that it has on power is profound. The Hoover Dam, because of those low water levels, is currently operating at a quarter reduced capacity. Talk to me about the importance of power and how the dam is important in that way. As the lake goes down, less and less power is generated at the dam. And for every foot that the elevation drops, the capacity drops by roughly five and a half megawatts. That means each lost foot of water powers 4,000 to 6,000 American homes. Kristen Averett works as Nevada State Climate Policy Coordinator. Did you sort of see this coming to this extent? This is precisely the kind of thing that we've expected all along with respect to climate change. I will say it's visceral, and for those of us who have worked on this kind of issue for decades, it's really sad to see that it's actually here. The city of Las Vegas gets 90% of its water supply from Lake Mead, which means there's quite literally not a drop to waste. Meet Cameron Donnarumma, a water waste investigator with the Las Vegas Valley Water District. He and his colleagues are here seven days a week in their not-so-subtle patrol vehicles to make sure local water regulations are followed. I drive through areas in the Las Vegas Valley. We look for any kind of water waste violation that we can find, so anywhere from watering on a non-assigned day, anything that's malfunctioning, such as a broken sprinkler, broken dripping meters, stuck irrigation valve, irrigation system leaks. Because you can kind of see here, this water that was running was pretty excessive. It came from these sprinklers here. But so you'll mark it and then check it again? Yeah, whenever I have time, yeah. Even though it's jarring to see what looks like a, a police vehicle looking for water violations, it does sort of make you wonder about these broader issues about the sustainability of these cities in what is literally a desert. This summer, Nevada became the first state in the nation to completely ban certain types of grass, grass they call non-functional. And so the city is ripping out grass that's purely ornamental in places like medians and office parks. And when you consider the fact that our community has grown by about 800,000 people during the past 20 years, but we've reduced our consumption of Colorado River water by 23 percent, it's a remarkable achievement that this community has made by everybody doing their part in using water as wisely as possible. From here, the river flows south into Mexico, but before reaching the Gulf, its water is distributed west into California and east into Arizona. 
Chelsea McGuire is a third-generation Arizona farmer who grew up in the agricultural heart of the state, Arizona's Pinal County. She now works for Arizona's Farm Bureau and says life here is about to change. What I think we're going to see is a significant percentage of land in central Arizona that's no longer being farmed. And the unfortunate reality of that is that it's not just that that land's going to be empty, it's that that, that land's going to be empty and dusty. So this feels a little bit like a tipping point, like we're ceding now territory to sort of a changing climate. I think so. Yeah, it's a, we're ceding it to at least a, a difference in the way that we're managing that land based on the resources that we have to manage it. While farmers are increasingly struggling to keep their crops watered, ranchers are in a battle to keep their cattle alive. Lori and Emmett Sturgill run a ranch in northwestern Arizona that they estimate feeds almost 5,000 American families. You've sort of just seen, and you, and you look at the climate, is the water the kind of the biggest indicator from what you've seen on the ranch? It, it pretty much is the key indicator. If you don't have rain, you don't have cows. If you don't have feed, you can't have cows. And so it all boils down to the rain and the water. And there's no possible way you can continue to feed the cattle. We're hoping and praying to God that the monsoon will continue and we'll be able to stay in business with the cattle that we have. We've been, my wife and I have been over 20 years building the, the current herd that we have. I've had to sell all my cattle before because You've of drought. through something like this I before. have, I have, yeah. Is this worse than before? It is, it is. In what this way? is it, Well, it's drier, longer. Hundreds of miles from the river itself, we see a resource taxed both by rural consumption and urban growth. The cities in America's Southwest are warming faster than anywhere else in the country. And some of these cities are growing faster than any of the cities in the country. Take, for example, the greater Phoenix area. Now, the trick is how to bring the little water that the Colorado River has to offer to communities like this one in the desert. Ted Cook manages the Central Arizona Project, this 336 mile long canal that brings water from the Colorado River through Arizona's two main growing population centers, Phoenix and Tucson as well as the crucial farmland in between. But it feels also like people are a little bit separated from where their water comes from, and they don't understand that it takes hundreds of miles and all kinds of regulations and all kinds of, what you do is very complicated. They've never had to worry. The water is always there for them. Is it becoming more scarce? Yes, are we having these cutbacks? Yes, we are. But there's water stored underground. We're working on augmentation projects. It, it, is, it is not like Arizona is suddenly going to hit a wall and we're going to say, oh no, what happened? That will not happen overnight. Arizona state law requires developers to prove they have 100 years of assured water supply before starting new projects here. But how much a state like this diverts to solutions that avoid a climate catastrophe remains an open question. One that Senator Mark Kelly, by virtue of his day job, spends much of his time focused on. We met up with him outside his home in Tucson. Washington has to address it. Yeah. How is Washington going to address it? And that's what we're doing. And this uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill that I was one of the uh, 22 senators, 11 Democrats, 11 Republicans, that's one of the things I worked a lot on, was uh, Western water infrastructure. So there's money in there uh, to do things like repair old aqueducts and linings of canals that help us uh, so we don't lose as much water through just leakage into the into the soil as we transport water across the state. So there are billions of dollars in this infrastructure bill to address water storage and water resiliency issues in Arizona. Farmers, ranchers, urban water protectors, and planners, climate experts, and U.S. senators are all united in at least one thing, a concern for future generations here in the southwestern United States. Climate is one of, in my opinion, it's our biggest long-term national security issue. I just had a grandkid that was, my granddaughter was born three and a half months ago. Um, you know, she is gonna be around in the year 2100. What does the state of Arizona look like? Have we taken the right steps with climate resiliency, with water storage to make sure that Arizona is still a great place to live? I'm convinced it will be, but it just doesn't happen on its own. Cal Perry joins me now from Fountain Hills, Arizona, which is just outside of Phoenix. And let me pick up on this point. And I know you said that no development is started in the area in Phoenix without proof of a 100-year water supply. But Phoenix was the fastest-growing city in America the last 10 years. Is there going to be a point where they have to say, we'd love to have you, you can visit, but you can't stay? We don't have enough water to let you live here. 
I think it's time we start thinking like that. We've been very hubristic in the way that we've looked at this in the Southwest. To give you an example, the states agreed on the water cuts in 2007, and they only looked at Lake Mead dropping to an elevation of 1,025 feet. We're like 25 feet away from that. So that agreement that they signed in 2007 is going to need to be rethought through and renegotiated within 20 years of being signed. It gives you an idea of sort of how the states didn't see this coming as quickly as it has come, Chuck. And I guess I want to leave you with this question, which is, look, you, we knew the problem going in, but you just got sort of a, a, the type of tour that many people don't get. What shocked you? You know, I, I think one of the things was sort of the giving up of the farmland. That's obvious. I think that will shock everybody. What really shocks me is the thought that I can't shake that no infrastructure bill is going to make it snow more in the Rockies, right? There's a limit to what this infrastructure bill and what $8.3 billion can do. It's a Band-Aid. 10% of the Colorado River, Chuck, evaporates before it even reaches these cities because of the heat. So this is a climate story. This is about a climate that has changed. People are going to need to live their lives differently. That is a hard sell today in America. Cal Perry, terrific job on this report. Really appreciate the hard work you put into this. Thank you, sir. And joining me now to talk more about the importance of the Colorado River is Colorado Senator Michael Bennett. He recently actually traveled down the river with his Republican colleague from the state next door, Utah, Senator Mitt Romney, to try to shed more light on this issue that this climate change issue is real and now it's impacting people's lives. Senator Bennett, welcome. Uh, and just let's talk about this trip down the river. You guys decided to do this right after the federal government announced um, for the first time that they were going to have to do some restrictions on water use from the Colorado River. So, look, this was clearly about bringing more attention to this. Um, but what else did you learn on this trip? Well, you know, the, the, the other thing that happened, Chuck, this summer was there was one day when the worst air quality in the world was in northern Utah and Denver, Colorado, worse than Beijing because of the fires from California. And so I said to Mitt, you know, maybe we ought to spend some time on the river talking about climate, talking about uh, forestry and water issues. And I brought some people from Colorado. He brought some people from Utah. And basically what we were trying to do was establish and reestablish some relationships because these states are going to have to come together to figure out how to manage a resource that is half of what uh, we thought the half of the flow we thought that it would be one of the largest economies on planet Earth relies on that river, and we're not making any more water. So we're going to have to, in our own time, just as our forebears had to figure out in theirs, figure out how to create a sustainable economy with an approach to the river. At the same time, I hope we can reach some conclusions here in Washington that can push us forward on climate change legislation because. That's really why the river is in the condition that it's in. You know, I love this quote from the Colorado Farm Bureau president. He said, you know, politicians can't make it rain. They can't make more water, but they can be sympathetic. So I guess is what is the role of the federal government here in trying to because, look, the, the great fear is that this instead of working instead of Colorado, Utah, Arizona, working together in Nevada on this mm -hmm. issue, uh, you go to war with each other. Look, the, the state of Florida and the state of Georgia, you know, sue each other over water issues. Right. Um, what role do you think the federal government should play in making sure that doesn't happen out west? I think it's really important that it is not a top-down approach from Washington, D.C. That's destined to fail. What's really important is that the upper and lower basin states come together and, and create a rational framework and expectation for how we're going to manage this resource in the coming years. I think the federal government can support that with uh, resources, which we're doing in the reconciliation package and the, in the bipartisan bills. We actually end up able to pass those. But in a, that's going to be a continuing need. There's going to be more need for water infrastructure. There's going to be more need to help farmers and ranchers along the way. There's going to be more need to uh, to, to develop innovative technologies to save water and conserve water. Uh, and, and everybody's going to be in it together. And I think the federal government can play an important role doing that. I also think, my own view, is that it's very important for us to make some big moves on climate change at the national level, to have a clean electricity standard, to right. put a price on carbon, 
uh, so that we can address the root causes of this issue. Because the farmers in Colorado can't address those root causes on their own. No, they can't. And that's what I feel like that this is going to be where their disconnect is. Like on one hand, you talk about the big issues that we've got to deal with to protect us for the next 30 to 50 years. But in the meantime, these farming communities, this is their livelihood. This is about survival now. They're not going to, you know, 30 years from now, that's nice. And they're certainly, I think you talked to plenty of farmers, they're worried about the next generation, but they're more concerned about whether they can survive in this fight over water. I mean, I understand we can't have a top-down approach, but you saw that in Nevada, we're going to have water police, right? There's water yep. police in Las Vegas. Are we going to have to do that with our agricultural community? There's going to be perhaps more of a, an enforcement mechanism in order to conserve water. I, I think that it's much more likely that we're going to find our way through a, a, a agreement among farmers themselves and their states. But I'll give you another example of something that's a live issue that the federal government really could do. After last year, Colorado had three worst fires in our state's history as a result of climate change. And I asked, what would it cost to, to do the forest mitigation, watershed protection, that is of our national forests in the West. And the answer was $60 billion, which is about what we spend fighting fires over the course of five years. But when you fight a fire, it costs $50,000 an acre to fight that fire. If you can do the forest mitigation, it costs about $1,500 an acre, and it can give our farmers and ranchers a real sense that we're protecting the, the resource, and they do deeply care about the next generation of Americans. I think that if we were able to pass that in Washington, put a s serious investment on the landscape and in our watersheds, yeah. be able to say to farmers and ranchers, that's actually what climate legislation looks like, you might find yourself building a very unusual coalition of people to support the next round of effort yeah. around climate change. You're an eternal optimist about working across the aisle. Um, Look, uh, it, when we're doing this interview is at a time of crazy dysfunction. Uh, and it's possible people will be watching this. Maybe we've gotten through this round of dysfunction. But why should people be optimistic that, that we're going to see a bipartisan consensus solve, start no, to tackle we this? Don't, I don't think people should be optimistic about it. I think we as a country have to work hard for it. It turns out that democracy is much more difficult than any of us ever thought, certainly than I ever thought. Uh, I think the women that spent decades fighting for the right to vote, the self-evident right to vote, they probably felt that it was more difficult than it should have been. The people who fought for the self-evident proposition that one group of humans shouldn't own another group of humans, we have those fights in our own time, and it would be wrong for us to expect that it's going to be easy to do it. There are people in Washington, D.C. that are completely unwilling to work with each other and, and, and address, for example, climate change. And we have to address climate change. But ultimately, and I, this is over the long term, Chuck, ultimately we're, what we're going to have to have in this country is something that we think of as American climate policy, just like we used to have something called American foreign policy. Right. And whether you were a Democratic president or a Republican president, you knew what your job was with respect to the Soviet Union. That's what we've got to do with climate. It, I know right. that seems impossible today, and I'm not here to be Pollyannish or ridiculous about it. Right. I'm here to say the only way we're going to create a durable policy solution that we can pass to our kids and to our grandkids yep. if we can get right. past the ridiculous politics that we're in right now and, and, and create something durable. And, and as long as I've got a chance to work on it, right. I'm just going to keep working. The debate should be how we do it. Not whether we should do it. And I think Absolutely that's what you're trying right. to get there. Michael Bennett, Democrat from Colorado, really appreciate you coming on and telling us about that trip down the river. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks. Great to see you. Great to see you. As we go to break, you might remember one of the early warnings on this issue was Al Gore's 2006 documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. Some people thought it was a bit alarmist. Well, 15 years later, many of the climate change predictions from the former vice president have come true. In 1992, they measured this amount of melting in Greenland. Ten years later, this is what happened. And here's the melting from 2005. Tony Blair, scientific advisor, has said that because of what's happening in Greenland right now, the maps of the world will have to be redrawn. So the issue of climate change can feel overwhelming to some. Is there any reason to be hopeful at all? And how do we bridge the divide with people who don't even want to talk about this issue at all? Climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe talks a lot about this issue. 
Uh, and she joins me now. Dr. Hayhoe, welcome. Uh, and look, I am one of those people that at times this feels so enormous of a problem. You don't know where to begin, you know, and, and there's the old adage, uh, how do you eat? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Uh, and this is one of those giant problems. So where do you find the optimism? Well, join the club. I feel exactly the same way many days as a climate scientist looking at what's happening to our world. But what I found is that if we want hope, we have to go out and look for it. It does not come to us. And when we act, hope is everywhere. When we look at what individual people are doing, what corporations are doing, what cities are doing, what some countries are doing too, what all kinds of people are doing, we realize that this whole climate thing is not a giant boulder sitting at the bottom of an impossibly steep cliff with only a few hands trying to push it up the cliff. It is already at the top of the cliff and it's already rolling down the hill on the other side in the right direction. Yeah. It's got millions of hands on it. It just needs more to go faster. You know, it's, it's funny. It's like the, to me, the, when, when people ask, well, when, it, when, is, when is our changing our behavior uh, help solve an environmental problem? And the ozone layer is probably the best example, at least in my lifetime. You know, what lesson can we take from that and apply it to everything we're trying to tackle right now? The biggest lesson from that is that when government and industry listens to scientists and makes quick decisions based on what the facts of the matter are, we truly can solve a problem. But when we somehow set up these false conflicts between what facts and data tell us and what governments and companies want to do, that's what ends us up in the mess that we're in today. We need change, and every single one of us as an individual has an important role to play in that change. We might not be an elected official, we might not be a president or a CEO, but we have a voice. And the only way the world has changed before substantially is when people use their voices to call for that change. And you know what? We're not doing it. Only 14% of us talk about climate change according to a poll that just came out last week. You call it global weirding, not global warming. What do you mean by that? Well, for most of us, we don't see the increase in the temperature of the entire planet. We don't monitor thousands of weather stations around the world and add up all those temperatures and fit a trend line to them. We live in a certain location, and wherever we live today, things are getting weirder. We see that our temperatures are not what they used to be. Our heavy rainfall is more intense. Wildfires are burning greater area. Hurricanes are ratcheting up from a tropical storm to a Category 4 seemingly overnight and flooding greater and greater area with more rain. Wherever we live, things are getting weird, and that is what we are experiencing. You know, I think one of the things with climate change that, you know, you want to be able to tell the individual, hey, you can make a difference. Go get an electric vehicle. Maybe you start your own compost. Uh, and yet at times, you, you, I think people sit there and say, well, well if government, though, isn't going to act, you know, how is me using a paper straw going to do anything? So I, I guess, how do you bridge this divide? I completely agree with you. We're told here's climate change, which poses an existential crisis to human civilization as we know it. That's what is at risk, not the planet, our civilization. And then people say, well, go out and use a paper straw and make sure you recycle and eat less meat too. And don't get me wrong, of course those things are all good things to do. But they are not going to fix the crisis in and of themselves. The most important thing they do is they change us. And when we talk about them, they show other people that other people are making a difference. And when we use our voices to talk about how things can be different at every table that we sit at, which is not just our personal lives, we all, we work somewhere, we might attend a yeah. school, we live in a neighborhood, we might be part of a place of worship, we might be part of another organization. Wherever we live, we can use our voice to say, how can we be part of the solution? Let's look around and find another business like ours that's doing something. Maybe we could do that, too. Let's look around and find another church that's doing something. Maybe we could do it, too. Yeah. When we work together, that's where we find hope, and that's where change starts. You think it's almost we're better off not looking to politicians and the elected officials? We're so polarized, and politics is such a dirty word, that you're almost better off going to your congregation if you're a religious person, going to your place of work and, and, and being an activist there rather than worrying about the politics? Using our voice is important and using our voice to call our congressional representatives and say, hey, you know, this infrastructure bill makes sense because we all need infrastructure. That is something we can all do. But they it's not up to them alone. 
It is up to all of us, wherever we are, to make changes with whatever responsibility we have. And obviously, as elected officials, they have a lot more responsibility than most of us. But each of us has something that we can bring to the table, which includes using our voices in a democratic system, but it also includes making changes where we are too. And I'm not just talking about our personal lives. I'm talking about every sphere of influence that we're in, including where we put our pension, where we bank, where we have our credit cards, and where our company gets its energy. All of those things are things that we can change. Well, I like the idea that you have some hope. We have to go find it. You have enthusiasm for it. Uh, I, re I really appreciate you coming on and sharing that hopeful optimism with us. Thank you so much for having me. You got it. So that's all we have for this week. Look, we did a little good cop, bad cop, right? We know the crisis is here and it's daunting. Guess what? There are ways we can tackle this. And number one way we can tackle it is start acknowledging that, hey, let's debate how we fix this, not whether we should. Uh, next week on Meet the Press Reports, is America losing the modern day space race? We're used to thinking of space as two things, American and requiring the horsepower of a nation state to get there. But both of those assumptions have exploded in the past five to six years. So together with my colleague, NBC News correspondent Jacob Ward, we're going to explore this final frontier and what the battle of billionaires versus nation states means for our future as a whole. Thanks for being here. I'll see you next week right here on Peacock and this Sunday on Meet the Press. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.